In this video, we're going to talk about indefinite integration and motion, or the antiderivatives of motion. To get started, let's remember what the derivatives um, of motion are, are, as we're familiar with them. So let's start by writing x for position. Uh, and then underneath of it, write the derivative of position with respect to time is velocity. Because when you take the derivative of position, you get velocity. Then the second derivative of position with respect to time, or the derivative of velocity with respect to time is acceleration. So as we go from position to velocity to acceleration, we are deriving. And anti-deriving is simply going backwards, starting from acceleration, getting velocity, or getting position. So if I had x equals 3t squared plus 2t plus 4, then the derivative v would tell me 6t plus 2, and the acceleration would be 6. So the process of going down, starting with position and going to acceleration, that's the deriving process. The anti-deriving process um, is a little bit different. So like, let's say I started with acceleration equals 6, and I anti-derived. Well, when you anti-derive, you always have to add this constant of integration. And if I anti-derive again, I would need to call this constant of integration 1, so that I could do, let's see, t squared, and then the 6, I would divide by 2, so that's 3. And I need to say, well, c1 is some constant. Maybe it's, I don't know, 2, 3, or 4. So I'd have to put a t there and then have a second constant of integration. OK, so if I started with 6 and I anti-derived, um, the difference is that I don't actually know what this constant of integration is going to be. And when I anti-derive again, I don't know what the second constant of integration is going to be. So this begs the question, what does the constant of integration actually represent when you are doing the indefinite integral? And to answer that question, we have to actually think about what is it that the antiderivative is telling us? So if the derivative is telling us about slope, then the antiderivative is telling us about area. Let's draw some graphs to help us wrap our minds around this. Okay, so draw a position, velocity, and acceleration versus time graph. Um, and let's use the equations that we were just working for as sort of an example. 3t squared plus 2t plus 4, that would be kind of a quadratic graph. So it starts at some point and has a smiley facing curve. Um, then the velocity versus time graph is going to have a constant slope. And the acceleration versus time graph, it was just 6. So it would just be a line that's flat at 6. OK, so the derivatives of these things tell us about uh, the next graph. So like the derivative of position versus time tells us v. And remember that the derivative tells us the slope. So that is the slope. And then the derivative of velocity versus time tells us acceleration. So that's what the slope of velocity versus time tells us about. And remember, the slope of acceleration versus time is called a jerk. But we're not really going to go much. We're not going to go to the next graph. We're not going to look at jerk versus time graphs. Um, so if the derivative is telling us about slopes, the antiderivative is telling us about the opposite of slope with graphs, which the opposite of slope with graphing is the area. Because remember, the area of a acceleration versus time graph is the change in velocity. And the area of a velocity versus time graph is the change in position. So anti-deriving is telling me about the previous graph. If I anti-derive the acceleration versus time equation, I'm going to learn about the area or the change in velocity of the object. And if I anti-derive the velocity versus time graph, I'm going to learn about the area or displacement, change in position of the object. 
Now, the way that we write that we're finding the area is a little goofy. So let's let's talk about that notation. Um, so delta v equals. Okay, so delta v is the area of acceleration versus time graph. And here's how we write that we are finding the area by using the indefinite integral. We are going to draw a line on the acceleration versus time graph. And we are going to say that the height of that line is the function. Okay, so a t. This is the height of that line. <laughs> okay, kind of weird. The width of this line is so small that it's infinitely small. So if I multiply the height by a width that is infinitely small, so that's the width, then I get this rectangle, <laughs> this infinitely thin rectangle um, that has an area at that exact moment in time. So it's almost like finding the area of a line tells you the, the area at a moment or the change in velocity at a moment. Well, if I want to know the change in velocity over all moments, you know, indefinitely, then I would need to add up every single possible line. So if I infinitely add these lines together, I'm going to get that area indefinitely. Well, if you haven't guessed already, the notation that we use for infinite addition is summa. Because it's just like sigma, which means sum, but it's a special sum because it's an infinite sum. So we say summa. So we infinite. <laughs> infinite add. We'll write that. We infinitely add the area of all of these lines. So if we do that, it's kind of like a printer. It's like, we just keep adding infinite, 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 and then we get the change in velocity. Well, you should notice that this notation is the notation of our indefinite integrals. Um, and there's this one weird thing, though. When we try and find the indefinite integral, we normally have to add a c onto the end of it. But the reason why we have to do that is because, really, the indefinite integral gives you a change in the original function. So in this case, the indefinite integral of acceleration with respect to time gives you the change in velocity. Well, the change in velocity, the change in velocity can be written as v minus v naught. And if I add the initial velocity to the right, then I begin to realize that the constant of integration really is the initial uh, value of the original function, which we call this the initial condition. So the constant of integration is some initial condition um, that I can't know by integrating or taking the antiderivative. And if we look back at the example that we did before, let's look at the first antiderivative that we did, c1. c1 looks a lot like 2, right? Which, in those equations, that represents v0, the initial velocity. So we could say, instead of c1, v0. And if maybe somewhere in the problem I was told that v naught is 2, then I could say plus 2 and plus 2t. Well, the same is true for the um, indefinite integral or the antiderivative of velocity. If I do the indefinite integral of velocity, I will look at the area, so delta x equals, and I'll take a line that has a height of the whatever the value of the function is multiplied by an infinitely small change in time for the width and then I infinitely add that all up and if I expand delta x to x minus x naught and add the initial position suddenly I see that the constant of integration is really the initial position and if I look back at my example 
when we took the antiderivative of velocity, we got position, but we had this second constant of integration that we didn't know. Well, if you see from above, that looks a lot like the initial position from our position equation. So we could call this x naught, and if we knew that the initial position was 4, then we could replace that simply with 4. So when you derive, you take a look at slope. When you anti-derive, you take a look at area. When you derive, there is no missing information. You don't need to be told anything outside of the calculus that you're doing. However, when you anti-derive or indefinitely integrate, there is always going to be a missing piece of information. And that missing piece of information is always the initial condition of the new equation that you're creating. So like for velocity, that's the initial velocity. We anti-derive from acceleration, well, we get an equation, but we don't know the initial velocity. And the same for position. We can get a position equation if we anti-derive velocity, but we can't know what the initial position was from um, that antiderivative. And again, that's because when you anti-derive, you're looking at areas, and areas tell you changes in the function. They don't tell you like the exact velocity that you're at. They tell you the change in your velocity. And if I look at the area of velocity versus time, I'm not getting the exact position I'm at. I'm getting the change in my position um, in, in that indefinite time. Okay, so maybe this all is a bit like in your head, right? It's a little lofty. We've kind of explained it quite a bit. Let's do a concrete example. If we do a concrete example, I think this will make a lot more sense. Marty McFly, the physics fly. Here he is. His velocity is given by the equation v equals alpha. Oh, you know what? Sorry. v equals alpha t squared plus beta t, where alpha is 5 meters per second squared, and beta is negative 2 meters per second. Um, that is in typo, too. Hold on. Sorry, there we go. Alpha is 5 meters per second cubed, and beta is negative 2 meters per second squared. Sorry. McFly starts from rest and at the origin. What is McFly's acceleration at 2 seconds? What is McFly's position at 2 seconds? Okay, well, so the first thing that I would do is I would take this velocity equation, and I would write it a bit more math-friendly. So... For part A, I would say the velocity is 5t squared minus, minus 2t. Um, and to get the acceleration, I'm going to have to anti-derive. So the antiderivative, sorry, to get the position, I'm going to have to anti-derive. But to get the acceleration, I just have to take the derivative. So the acceleration is going to be 2 times 5 is 10, t minus 2. So to get the acceleration at 2 seconds, I just plug in 2, 10 times 2 minus 2. And that is going to give me 18. So the acceleration is 18 meters per second squared. And to get the position, I'm going to have to start with the velocity equation and anti-derive. So if I do the anti-derivative, um, maybe we should write that for ourselves. We would say x equals the anti-derivative of 5t squared minus 2t with respect to t. Um, so that's going to give us t cubed and then 5 divided by that new power, so 5 thirds t cubed, don't really need to simplify that, minus t squared, and then 2 divided by that new power is really just 1, so we can leave that as minus t squared. Now normally at this point we would write plus c, but we just learned that the uh, constant of integration is the initial condition of the function we're looking at. So we can just think, oh, what is that going to be for position? Well. It's x naught, the initial position. So that's the initial condition that we don't know. Now I can take a look at the problem and think, am I told what the initial position is at some point? And in this case, 
when it tells me that you start at the origin, then it is telling you the initial position is zero. So you can actually get rid of it. And now you have an equation for position that you can plug in your time. So the position at two seconds, five thirds, uh, two cubed minus two squared is going to be 9.3 repeating meters. So now I've used the antiderivative to find the position, knowing that the initial position was zero. Okay, great. Let's do another example. The acceleration of a car in a video game is given by the equation a equals at cubed plus bt, where a and b are constants. The car is initially traveling forward 8 meters a second, and it starts 14 meters behind the origin. What will the units of A and B need to be? Well, so we haven't really talked about that too much, but let's think about this for a second. So if our acceleration equation is based on time, then A and B need to be something that when multiplied by t cubed and t, that give us uh, units, sorry, that give us units of meters per second squared. And if I plug something in with t, then it's going to have a unit of seconds. And if I plug something in with t cubed, it's going to have a unit of seconds cubed. So for the a, the thing that's being multiplied by the seconds cubed, I'm going to need a unit of meters per second to a power that when I multiply by seconds cubed, I'm left with seconds squared. So that would have to be seconds to the fifth. Because when I do meters per seconds to the fifth times seconds cubed, then three of those meters uh, per second to the fifth are going to become meters per second squared. And then for B, um, it's going to need to be meters per second cubed. So that when I take one of those away, meters per second cubed times seconds, when I take one of those away, I'm left with meters per second squared. Um, so it's called unit agreement. Sometimes the AP test is going to ask you about that, um, often in a multiple choice question. Anyway, we haven't talked about it in a while, so just a quick refresher. So the units for A are going to be meters per second to the fifth, and the units for B are meters per second cubed. Usually they're just given to you in a problem, um, and you just have to trust that they agree and give you meters per second squared at the end for acceleration, and meters per second for velocity, and meters for position. Awesome. Okay, back to the calculus. Part B, find the instantaneous velocity and position at three seconds. Okay, well, if I need to find the velocity and the position, then that means I need to write my equation, which in this case um, is going to be alpha t cubed plus beta t. I need to write that in a little bit of a math-friendly way and then take the antiderivative. So it tells me that a is 2 and b is 3, so I can write a equals 2, b, oh that worked out well, and b equals 3, then antiderive to get velocity. When I antiderive, t gets raised one power, and then I divide 2 by that new power. 2 over 4 is 1 half. Then you raise 3t to a power of 2 and divide 3 by that 2. Ordinarily, we would need to write plus c, but now we know that the initial velocity is our constant of integration for velocity when we anti-derive acceleration to get velocity. And then I can think, well, am I told what the initial velocity is in this problem? And I, in fact, am told that the initial velocity is 8 meters per second forward. So I would write a positive 8 meters per second for the initial velocity, and instead of writing plus v naught, I could write plus eight. Okay, great. Um, now, to find the velocity at three seconds, I would just plug three into that equation.
and this would give me 62 meters per second. So velocity at 3 is 62. Okay, well, to get the position at 3 seconds, I would do the antiderivative again. So t raised to a power of 5, and then I divide 1 half by 5, which is really going to become 1 tenth. Uh, and then I raise t squared to a power of 3, and divide 3 halves by 3, which is going to give me 1 half. And then 8 becomes 8t. And of course, since this is an indefinite integration, I have to add the constant of integration c. But now we know that the constant of integration is really the initial position for this position equation. So we can write plus x naught. Then I look at my problem and think, did it tell me the initial position? And it did. It told me the initial position is 14 meters behind the origin. So that implies that the initial position, we can call it x naught, is actually going to be negative 14 meters. So I would write minus 14. Okay, so now I have an equation that I can plug 3 seconds into. The position at 3 is 1 tenth. 3 seconds to the fifth, plus 1 half, 3 seconds cubed, plus 8 times 3 seconds, minus 14, which gives me 47.8 meters. Okay, great. So this video had a lot of content, but now you know how to use both the derivative and the antiderivative um, of position, velocity, and acceleration to learn basically everything about a problem. With the derivative, you always have enough information to uh, answer what you're, you're being asked to do. But with the antiderivative, sometimes you have to go back to the problem and look for those initial conditions. Because the initial conditions, those are the C's, the constants of integrations. Um, and if you're given those constant of integrations, then you are able to solve the problem. If you're given the initial conditions, you can solve the problem. Congratulations. You are super smart. Hopefully this video was helpful and will be useful for you in your academic pursuits.